Greeks, for some reason, uh, really uh, cling uh, to their culture. And I wouldn't call our identity Greek because we're American, but it's a very strong Greek-American identity. Alexander's father, George Payne, orchestrated a successful event. I thought, oh, this is fun because everybody, the Greeks were having fun out there dancing, had look like in a family affair. I couldn't concentrate on nothing. My whole focus was getting the car back. Me and my dad's car, and uh, it just meant the world to us. Think of the little kids that will get a bear. Hug a bears are given to children to love on when they're in distress. We don't see where they go, but we have it in here, you know. From 3 News Now and the Omaha World Herald, this is Omaha Sunday Morning with Jennifer Griswold. Good morning and thanks for joining us this Sunday. I'm Jennifer Griswold. It's been a big week for kids and parents as nearly all local schools are now back in school. Most Omaha Public School students returned to class on Wednesday. For some, jitters turned to smiles thanks to a warm welcome and a special send off into the new school year. 3 News Now reporter Shante Passmore takes us in the classroom. A soggy Wednesday morning can't dampen the mood at Mount View Elementary School. Dressed to the nines on standby <laughs> is a small army of greeters. How you doing? Every child. You good? To every car door. Hello. Is met with a smiling face from Willie Hamilton. Good morning. And a reminder. You're going to learn today. People say words don't matter. I disagree with that. So much so, the Black Men United leader rallies dads, granddads, uncles, you name it, to make sure these kids feel welcomed, encouraged, ready to conquer this school year. Hamilton even asked women to get in the game. He never expected this. <laughs> New superintendent, Dr. Cheryl Logan. I didn't, I didn't think he was coming. I, I surprised you. Dropping in and amping up the school year kickoff. It was nice to see her out here. She brings such energy and excitement. Men, women, grown-ups of all kinds, and their support of these students spills into society because Hamilton says... Children, educators, teachers, we're all in this together. It's a reflection of the kind of world we all want. One with kindness, motivation, and plenty of smiles. Yeah. Oh, and everyone can help make a difference. Research shows that when dads and other father figures are engaged in their children's education, student grades and test scores increase. Many dads signed a pledge to volunteer 10 hours at their child's school over the course of the year. A new school year meant emotions ran high for many area parents. I have to include myself on that list as my three-year-old son Jack started preschool. You can see he was all smiles, but I have to admit I drove around to school after dropping him off just to see if I could get a glimpse of what he was doing. Proud of that kid. Back to school week meant haircuts for many kids, but this week a power outage stopped the Clippers during an annual event that helps underprivileged kids get a sharp do before heading back to class. But the lack of power did not stop the Capitol School of Hairstyling. 3 News Now anchor Emily Zink shows us how they kept going when the lights went out. So our power went out at about 8.45, which is 15 minutes before all of the students are supposed to be here. So. It was chaos, no power means no lights, and no clippers, no blow dryers, no curling irons, anything like that. But this lack of modern technology wasn't about to stop the staff at Capital School of Hairstyling from sending these kids from the Open Door Mission back to school and looking good. You can go comb and push down like oh. that, then it'll kind of give you a really clear view. It was all sheer over comb today, and we made it work. You just got to roll with it. Are we just trimming the back and sides? Are we doing anything with the top? Then around 10 o'clock, the lights finally came back on and stylists could use all the tools of their trade. I have a son who wanted to, uh, some designs done in his buzz cut and he thought it wasn't going to happen, but magically the power came back on and he's getting what he wants. The Open Door Mission appreciates the amount of effort the Capitol workers put in to help the students look their best for the first day of school. When they're doing whatever they can uh, for our kids, uh, and so uh, they're just uh, fantastic. They could have just said no, but uh, 
and sent us on our way, but they didn't. They accommodated us, so it was really great. It was definitely going to happen no matter what, and uh, we were going to make it work, and we'll work through it and figure it out and help anybody that we can. Great event, and the kids look great, too. After the haircuts, the children were treated to a showing of The Incredibles 2. Capital has been working with the Open Door Mission on the free school haircuts for several years now. Instead of a green screen and a TV studio, a group of weather watchers gets by with a few rocking chairs and their charm. We introduce you to the Windy Weather Crew from Windsor Manor. You'll see why the people at the Assisted Living Center in Iowa are creating a following on social media when Omaha Sunday Morning continues. Folks who live at an assisted living community in southwest Iowa are gaining some online fame by posting videos talking about the weather and adding a lot of wit. Meteorologist Audra Moore went to Shenandoah, Iowa to meet the weather crew and see what kind of stories they're telling. And what did you say the wind velocity was? Where are you going? The crew is made up of three residents, Marjorie Wright, Russell Hilker, and Kenneth Mathis and they are full of laughs and witty words. Boy, well, I'm going to put these back on. That makes me look pretty foxy. <laughs> Each member brings a unique trait to the trio. Wright calls the shots. Now, how does the weather affect you, Ken? Well, it hurts my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it does. Hilker brings the forecast for Shenandoah, and Mathis keeps track of some of the coldest and hottest temperatures across the United States. I can't get over the difference, you know, of what there is in Fairbanks, Alaska, and what it is in Phoenix and Las Vegas. It just blows my mind. While the trio was hesitant about the idea in the beginning, they look forward to it now. I said, okay, I'll just go ahead and try it. You know, you have to try everything. None of it's rehearsed either, which can lead to some entertaining moments. I guess I should put, put, a, put on my bathing suit, I think. <laughs> well, I would have been it's fun. Really not too you late, guys would have died. We don't get very serious, and sometimes we uh, get off the, the topic of uh, weather and bring up something else, so you never know what's going to come out of our mouths. The Windsor Windy Weather Crew posts new videos on Mondays and Fridays. You can find those on their Facebook page, Windsor Manor. Reporting in Shenandoah, Iowa, Audra Moore, 3 News Now. Oh, I just love them. And I agree, she does look foxy, doesn't she? Well, the next couple of days, a slow moving system will bring some big weather changes to the area. After a warm day Saturday, the week ahead will be much cooler with highs in the upper 70s to low 80s. As a couple of fronts pass through, rain chances will increase this afternoon and evening and will linger into Monday. By Tuesday, we start drying out and temperatures gradually start warming back up again by the end of the week. Signs now greet people hoping to get their boat in the water on one area lake. The rules now in place for Cunningham Lake as officials work to stop the spread of zebra mussels. How they're dealing with the problem next on Omaha Sunday Morning. The housing market is hot, 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 with home prices soaring in neighborhoods like Exarvin, where one 20-year resident just listed her house for sale. As the swarm of prospective buyers crammed her open house, she sat in her car parked across the street spying on buyers, surprised at the sheer quantity of people who wanted to see her seemingly overpriced house. What happened next might seem abnormal for most people, but as Omaha World Herald visual journalist Megan McGill shows us, in today's market, it's business as usual. We have lived here for almost 23 years. When we knew our daughter again was going off to college, we thought, why not? And we knew the market was really good right now. We had no idea how good it was. When it was an open house, we had 103 people in two hours. And within two days, we had a couple of offers. When the realtor came over to meet with us, she actually had us write down on index cards what we thought we could get for the house. And she also did the same thing. And then we flipped them at the same time. And my husband and I, we had our jaws drop. We couldn't believe. And I said, there's no way that you can get that much for our house. And she got more than that. 
about 150% higher than the assessed value. We did have multiple offers. One was actually higher than the other. However, the, the lower offer also was accompanied by a letter. <laughs> and so that touched my heart. And so I went with <laughs> the one with the letter. Uh, she painted the picture of what she saw in this house. And so I went with that. Unfortunately, the first person that we did accept the offer <laughs> she had to back out so the other offer our realtor went back to them and so they were our final offers yesterday we brought the kids back over because there is a hydrangea that we planted our kids have every first day of school picture taken in front of that hydrangea so we had to bring them back yesterday and take one final photo it's the only house that they've ever known so absolutely they're very connected it was just everything was the right time I just love that they got that photo. A recent Zillow report shows why house hunters might be having a difficult time finding that perfect home. The report found the U.S. is actually short more than 6 million homes in the market across the country. The leisure of boating on one area lake came to an end this week. It's all due to the arrival of invasive zebra mussels. The pests were found at Lake Cunningham. The Omaha Parks and Recreation Department says the lake's boat ramps are closed for the rest of the year. Owners of boats currently docked at Lake Cunningham have until mid-September to get them out of the water. No new boats will be allowed on the lake. State park officials say it only takes one mistake for zebra mussels to get from one place to another can educate you know 99 percent of them but if we have one guy that doesn't care or hasn't listened um, you know that it only takes one person zebra mussels spread like a virus latching onto other things like kayaks or fishing lures as well school is back in session and safety is on the minds of teachers parents and kids we take you to a training session held by an area gun range and security firm aimed to prepare students in case the worst happens that's next. Just in time for the start of school, Tactical 88, a gun range and security firm, is holding a school safe class for students and parents, even teachers. The goal is to help those who want to learn how to protect themselves know exactly what to do if a shooter ever entered their school. Omaha World Herald visual journalist Brendan Sullivan shows us how it works. All these schools say that you shouldn't fight, you just got to sit in the corner. Well, if you sit in the corner, I'm just going to give it to you straight. You're just going to die or, or become hostages inconveniencing the police. Here are three effective strategies to counter an active shooter assault. We can run, we can hide, we can fight. A great response time to a school might be four or five minutes. Well, in four or five minutes, someone can wreak a lot of damage unless the people inside are willing to fight back. And that's kind of what we're looking for, is hardening them so that they are willing to fight back and affect the outcome in a positive way. I'm a teacher, and I will not be a victim, and I will do whatever it takes to protect my students in my class. And so this class provided me with tools and strategies that I can use that are more proactive in helping keep my students safe. You need to either run, hide, or fight. That's not a step-by-step -step thing either. It's, it's just applying the, those three strategies um, depending on the circumstances. When it comes to my own children, I'm very, um, you know, factual. It's like, this happens, um, you need to be prepared. This, these are some things that you can do if this happens. I think you, you need to let kids know realities of life. You can't just um, keep them in the dark. You know, you need to give them tools and strategies in case this does happen. You can turn fear into anger and you can use that anger to totally beat the crap out of the guy and just completely stop. Because the shooter isn't expecting you to fight back because what do all these schools do? Their drill, their drill is to lock your door, turn out the lights and hide in the corner and hope the guy doesn't come in. Well, what if a guy does come in? Boom, you're, you're all dead. And so you, you gotta do something. And you, that adrenaline can also help the fight response.
think it would be very beneficial if students had this kind of training because it gives them power. And instead of just sitting back and taking it, they're able to go in, protect themselves, and not be victims. If we can get a number of students trained up in these techniques, if something happens in their buildings, they may be the heroes that we hope to report on in the future. School Safe is a two and a half hour safety course. There is an age requirement and parents are required to attend with the younger kids. A classic car snatched by a thief is back in the garage of its rightful owner. When Omaha Sunday Morning continues, we show you how police were able to track it down and the emotional roller coaster the owner says he's on even after the car was returned. A stunning vintage car went from being taken care of by its owner to taken. But with the help of investigators from several counties and pleas on social media, the car was tracked down and the thief put behind bars. But the emotional roller coaster is not over yet. 3 News Now reporter Jake Wazikowski spoke to the owner who says his car doesn't look the same. I mean, it's one of a kind. There's not another car around here like it. The 1973 Plymouth Barracuda oozes classic Americana, and Quint Mix says his was like a family member. It's me and my dad's car. And uh, it just meant the world to us, you know? On August 4th, Mick went to his Bellevue RV shop to get it ready for a car show to find the Cuda had been stolen. This here's the hole that they cut in the back of my shop to get in to take the car out. Mick and his daughter took to social media to get the word out. Dozens of shares later, it was spotted in Lincoln, Council Bluffs, and Fremont. I couldn't concentrate on nothing. My whole focus was getting the car back. With the exposure and work by investigators, they're able to track down the classic car on August 14th. They arrest 40-year-old Daniel Gregory on nine felonies, including having stolen property, drugs, and being a felon in possession of a weapon. The Barracuda partially taken apart to be sold. All the stripped parts were found stacked about six feet high, almost to the top of a shed. All the bolts found in this bucket in the passenger seat. That makes me sick to think that somebody could just tear a car like that apart. Gregory actually worked for Mick starting this year, but was let go. He previously has been to prison three times. I've never done the guy any wrong. Um, I just, I can't figure out right now to this day why he would do something like that to me. Mick says he doesn't care what shape the car was in. He vowed to rebuild it so he and his dad could cruise the streets once again. That's the reason that I didn't give up on finding the car. It's just, I mean, it, I know what it meant to him. Glad he got it back. Just tough that it's in such bad shape. There's a lot going on this week in Omaha, and here's a look at three things you need to know about. Miller Days kicks off this week. It runs Tuesday through Sunday. You can enjoy music, carnival fun, even a parade. Miller Days at 136 and Q wraps up Sunday with a morning car show, kids' activities, and a free ice cream social. Most people usually pour bad beer down the drain, but brewers at one local beer haven are putting it to good use. Brickway Brewery is holding a bad beer amnesty week, taking skunk beer from customers and replacing it with a dollar six pack from Brickway. There's also a number of activities planned for the week, starting with a kickoff party today featuring beer bingo. One of Omaha's oldest neighborhoods is getting ready to celebrate its history. The annual Dundee Days Festival kicks off on Saturday with an underwear run through the neighborhood to promote healthy living. Afterwards, there's a pancake breakfast and thousands will fill the streets for the Dundee Parade. The night wraps up with a concert and beer garden. Omaha's Greek Festival is serving up all the baklava and euros you can handle this weekend, but the annual event has a Hollywood tie you might not know about. We sit down with an Oscar winner who's hoping you enjoy all things Greek this weekend. Exploring ESP. Plus, are these the smartest animals? Mind Matters, Sunday morning. Yo, come on down to the Greek festival and have a good time. 
Alexander Payne, Omaha, an Oscar winner, director, writer, some of the words you probably think of when you hear his name. But recently, I sat down with the acclaimed movie maker to talk about something else entirely. Instead of an upcoming movie, you just heard it, he's promoting Omaha's Greek Festival. He explains why the event is so near and dear to his heart. Well, I'm proud to say that my father, George Payne, uh, now deceased, started the first Greek festival in Omaha in, I think, 1978. Might have been 79, but it was right around there. Alexander's father, George Payne, their family name was originally Papadopoulos, orchestrated a successful event. And we had at the time an extremely charismatic Greek priest who was master of ceremonies for all the the uh, dancing and the music and uh, encouraging people to, you know, pull their wallets out and, and spend, and spend they did. Decades later, these women put in the hours in the kitchen at St. John's Greek Orthodox Church between Park Avenue and 30th Street in Omaha. The fabulous food, rich in flavor and tradition, along with cultural performances and a sense of a community, lured Betty Chin to the Greek Orthodox Church years ago. Alexander Payne's mother, Peggy, is her godmother. I thought, oh, this is fun because everybody, the Greeks were having fun out there dancing, having kind of like in a family affair. Greeks, for some reason, uh, really uh, cling uh, to their culture. And I wouldn't call our identity Greek because we're American, but it's a very strong Greek-American identity. Payne also travels to Greece often since his wife is from there and they have a young child. You know, I'm Greek from Omaha and I married a Greek from the factory. Um, yeah, I pretty much will spend every summer uh, of my life in Greece, and there are worse fates. Of course, he also chooses to spend a lot of time in Omaha. Omaha has blossomed into the city we hoped it might, but weren't very optimistic about. His most recent film, Downsizing, premiered at the Dundee Theater. The main screen is named after his mom, who still lives in Omaha. A man who is adding culture to his hometown. Sounds like Alexander Payne learned something from his Greek festival founding father. In Omaha is not becoming like any other city. I think what's beautiful about Omaha is it's able to incorporate influences from outside but turn it into its own Omaha variety. Omaha keeps its soul. And there's still time to check out the Greek festival. It runs all day today. It's inside and outside St. John the Baptist Greek Orthodox Church. They do have a tent in case of rain. The search is over after a beagle puppy was dog napped while being seized by the Nebraska Humane Society. The dog hunt lasted for almost two weeks before the dog was finally found. 3 News Now reporter Jake Wyskowski has been following it since the beginning and was there when Lucky finally made her way back to her owners. <laughs> From the looks of it, Lucky, the four-month-old beagle, is back to her old tricks. A ball of energy and a bark to boot. But two weeks ago, she was snatched right out of the back of a Nebraska Humane Society van near 40th and Seward. The tenants were being evicted and animal control was seizing four dogs because the owners weren't home. Neighbor Dan Cooper caught it all on camera. His quick thinking helped get the dog home. I'm just glad they found the dog and I was glad they were able to, my help brought the dog back to the owner. The Humane Society says a tip that came into police pointed them in the right direction to locate Lucky. They wouldn't reveal where the dog has been and say the owner doesn't want to speak on camera. Well, we're thrilled to find Lucky. The owner's been distraught, obviously, when the dog was stolen. We took it somewhat personally at the Humane Society because it was stolen out of our truck. So our investigators did a great job this week, knocking on doors, shaking the bushes, talking to people, resulting in this dog being brought to us yesterday by a source that's going to stay anonymous. The Omaha Police Department is investigating and wouldn't say who the suspect is or what the motive was. Police reports indicate the suspect was there before NHS pulled up to get the dogs on August 3rd, and the landlord's son was not cooperating with investigators. The Humane Society says they've spoken to their officers about securing their vehicles and it won't happen again. They also say Cooper's quick work was also a big help. You got something on camera, it can help a lot. I mean, it shows what happened. You just, otherwise, you're just saying, well, I saw this happen when you have... Um, on the video, you can say, well, this is how it happened. The Humane Society says they will be paying out that $1,000 reward for the tip that led to the location of Lucky. Reporting from 90th and Fort, Jake Wasikowski, 3 News Now.
so glad she's okay and what a ball of energy. Well, they are cute and cuddly and carry a big responsibility to cheer up kids going through a tough time. To date, more than 40,000 handmade stuffed bears have been donated to numerous charities around the area since 2000. And it's all because of some faithful volunteers. Morning anchor Emily Zink gives us a look inside the Hug a Bears operation. I'm 87 years old. But Steve won't let me retire. Steve Dawkins runs a tight ship. <laughs> He's 96, I'll let him go. The man who sits at the head of the table. Well, I guess I'm commander in chief. Isn't actually all that intimidating. <laughs> Without Steve, it wouldn't go. His heart is as soft as the hug -a bears he makes. We don't see where they go, but we have it in here, you know. And you want to cry, but you hold it back, you know. Hug a bears are given to children to love on when they're in distress. They're delivered to area hospitals and fire stations. I think of the little kids that will get a bear. Alzheimer's patients also receive bears. Each one is cut from a template, sewn together, and stuffed with donated material from 3M. All of this is done by volunteers. We started at the plant doing it, and then we moved out here when we didn't have a place to go. Hug a Bear started decades ago as a community service project in the basement of Western Electric. If I get there, I'll be fine. <laughs> now retired, many of the former employees have followed the volunteer operation to a donated space at Maple Ridge Retirement Community. But it's not all work. I tell jokes. The Tuesday volunteer sessions are more like social time. It's just pleasure. It's just, we look forward to coming. Even with lots of laughter yeah. <laughs> and the occasional snack break. We always got something good to eat and drink. <laughs> this group is efficient. And I have a number over here of 43,000. So far, thousands of bears have been made. It's an ever-growing project that needs more volunteers. I just wish every seat was taken all the way down both sides. Dawkins says, come on down. You'll be hooked on hug -a bears just like him. I'm going to retire when it's 80,000. So you know what 80,000 is? How many years is that? A long way from now. That's how much I want to do it. Great work by them. The group meets every Tuesday from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. We will have more information on how you can volunteer on our website, 3newsnow.com. Also, this nonprofit is always in need of donations to keep them up and running. Inmates at the Omaha Correctional Center are seeing the fruits, or rather the, the flowers and vegetables of their labor, but they're not the only ones who get to enjoy the garden. A new project is focusing on providing a habitat for monarch butterflies and other pollinators. 3 News Now meteorologist Audra Moore stopped by to see what all the buzz is about. Here at the Omaha Correctional Center, inmates are putting their gardening skills to good use, improving their environment, and also creating a habitat for monarch butterflies. It all started with a workshop in conjunction with Metro Community College called Always Growing, where inmates work to create landscaping projects to help the butterflies while learning to work together and see something through to the end. To also get things started, the Henry Dordley Zoo donated 300 to 400 seeds of three different types of milkweed. Inmate Ed Segura says there were a few issues to get through in the beginning, like flooding, but that didn't stop them. Once we worked through all those issues, uh, things just come together. The plants responded. Uh, it was great seeing the monarch butterflies here. Um, we saw some caterpillars, uh, several of them. Through the program, Segura has gained skills that will be useful once he is released. I was also able to um, apply and, and uh, attain my applicator's license to apply uh, restricted use pesticides through Metro, so that, I was uh, real thankful for that opportunity. OCC's Grounds Corporal David Moore adds that the gardens are helpful for the monarchs and pollinators, but also for the inmates by providing some calming moments. So I think the plants that are here are going to help the inmates see that, you know, there's something good that goes on, not just the uh, brick and a fence and a cell to see every day. There are bigger plans in the works for moving forward with the gardens that will include a greenhouse coming in October. We are going to take our pollinator plants that we have, grow them and try to pay it forward to under, underprivileged schools and help out some of the other prisons that would like to have some plants that we can donate. Those involved have said it's exciting to see the garden continue to grow as well as the interest in the program. Reporting in Omaha, Audra Moore, 3 News Now. 
Inmates are also in charge of harvest, harvesting vegetables in the garden. So far this year, they've grown more than 1,000 pounds of tomatoes, all of which are used to make daily meals and homemade salsa. There's a big party planned in a small village about two hours northwest of the metro today. We'll explain why this anniversary celebration dating back to World War II is something not too many towns can celebrate when Omaha Sunday Morning continues. This weekend, a northeast Nebraska village is marking the 75th anniversary of a war incident few places in America can claim. The United States military accidentally bombed Tarnoff, Nebraska during World War II. Tarnoff is a village about 20 miles northwest of Columbus. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but it made an impact. 3 News Now reporter John Kipper went there and spoke with a man who was a teenager at the time. 75 years from this week, during World War II, a tiny town in northeast Nebraska found itself in the middle of the conflict. That's because several U.S. bombs missed their desired target on a practice range and struck the village of Tarnoff. Norbert Caesar was 13 years old and asleep when his mother woke him up around 4.30 on August 16, 1943. His house was seemingly under attack. I guess we were scared that there was something that could have killed somebody because my two sisters was about six foot away in bed. Seven practice bombs fell on the town after pilots missed a bombing range nearby. A few of those hit this house, including one through the roof. You still could see the fins, but that's about all you could see because it was all smashed. Nobody in the house or throughout town was hurt, but the county sheriff did clear the town while the military investigated. Now, 75 years later, a party is being thrown in Tarnov to remember the accidental assault with hundreds expected to show. There's only, I think, two or three cities that something like that happened. And uh, to be this small of a town with that kind of a distinction, I think it's really great. And it's what put us on a map. And I think it keeps us there, too. Caesar is now one of three people, including his sister, that recall the bombing. He says at the time, even the national news talked about the sleepy town of around 60. In fact, his brother in the military even found out. He was out in California, and my mother sent a telegram or whatever, and he knew about it before he got the telegram. Now, while they did help out a little bit, the U.S. government never fully reimbursed the family for the damage that they did to this house. In Tarnoff, John Kipper, 3 News Now. What a crazy story. Today the town is commemorating the 75th anniversary of that incident. There will be a variety of events, including a mass at 10 a.m. Other events throughout the day, there will be a beer garden, Vietnam wall display, raffles and games, and a scavenger hunt. It's an annual tradition for high school athletes, an elite team made up of the best of the best in high school football. Up next, we go behind the scenes of the Super 6 photo shoot. It's an annual tradition for high school athletes. This season, the 2018 version of the Omaha World Herald Super 6 high school football team may be one of the most talented groups ever. All six honorees will play major college football next season. Omaha World Herald visual journalist Megan McGill takes us behind the scenes for a look at some of the best players Nebraska and Western Iowa have to offer. Look away slightly and hold the chin. Usually the awkward smile, like I kind of want to be here, but I don't. <laughs> I think the smile says everything. All those guys are elite athletes for sure. All of them going to go play Division One football. So it's it's an honor to be to be associated with with guys like that. You guys can look at each other. The kid taking a good picture is me just being in it. I mean, hey, every picture's got to be good when I'm in it. We text, you know, every now and then. We text a lot, but obviously I know Chris, like, the backside of my hand, so it was good to get to know the other guys more. The most photogenic person of the group, I think, is Garrett Nelson. He's always brings a kind of the X factor when it comes to modeling, but 
he's a pretty he's a pretty great guy and just has a lot of energy. The most photogenic, that'd probably be Max. The quarterback, pretty boy. He might be ginger and has freckles, but he has a nice flow and a comb over to it. And he's just like, it doesn't move. The wind, I saw him, I looked at him during a picture and it was just stuck. And I don't think he puts any product or anything in it either. It's awesome just the relationship being built. I mean, I, I knew some of those kids, but you know, that was the first time that a little bit of them, but and now we're all we're all kind of the same people. We can all relate, you know, just being recruited and being uh, playing high school football. I think it was awesome just uh, getting to know him and building that relationship. The funniest would probably be Garrett. The funniest looking would probably be Nick. Chris's hair is terrible. They're into it. You can find more on this year's Super 6 as well as a look at the college careers of the Super 6 classes of the past five years on Omaha.com. Between Twitter, Facebook, and apps for everything, there's a number of ways to find out information. But editorial cartoonist Jeff Caturba is tackling the tough topic of sorting fact from fiction. That cartoon coming up. What has forced one million children to be raised by their grandparents? She's had to sacrifice almost everything. The deadly opioid epidemic. 60 Minutes Tonight. This Sunday morning, Mind Matters. What makes a genius? Actress Glenn Close on mental illness. And are there animals smarter than we are? Listen for the trumpet. Where do you get your news? From social media, the internet, Omaha World Herald editorial cartoonist Jeff Caturba tackles the issue of a free press and how it's now more important than ever to support trusted local news sources. I'm Jeff Caturba. I am the editorial cartoonist for the Omaha World Herald. The other day I was sitting at a bar minding my own business and maybe doing a little eavesdropping on a conversation. Call it reconnaissance. Oh, and for some of you, I was sitting at the bar drinking a cappuccino with almond milk. And for others, I was drinking a gin martini up with blue cheese olives. Mmm. Anyway, these two guys were talking about social media, and the one guy was saying he gets all of his news from Facebook. Ah, uh, the other guy freaked out, or maybe that was me freaking out. That's when I jumped into the conversation. Turned out the first guy was joking, I think. In fact, he said he has a subscription to the World Herald. I was relieved and thanked him for subscribing and almost bought him his cocktail, I mean his coffee. The bigger point in this era of questionable news on social media is that it's more important than ever to support trusted news sources. In fact, these past several days, newspaper editorial boards across the country have been writing about the importance of a free press. We certainly did here at the World Herald. I also drew a cartoon on the topic. All this in response to the negative things said by the current occupant of the White House, like how he called the media the enemy of the people, and how he has described the press as fake news. Sorry, Mr. President, but that's not the case. Granted, as the World Herald editorial points out, the nation's press is a human institution, and sometimes humans make mistakes. And yes, you have to be a smart consumer of the news, using your noggin, being a critical thinker. But by and large, the journalists I know work tirelessly to tell the truth and present just the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the day's news. So no matter what, Please don't rely on Facebook as your main source of news, unless, of course, you're clicking on the link that takes you to the Omaha World Herald. In which case, I hope you'll subscribe. And I may even buy you that cappuccino. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching Omaha Sunday Morning, and we'll see you back here next week.